welcome back. In episode one, we talked about liberal ideology, and in episode two, we talked about the history of liberalism and capitalism, before in episode three, talking about neoliberalism. I strongly recommend watching those videos first, as without them, you won't really understand what we're going to be talking about today. In this final part of the series, we're going to be talking about the big problems with liberalism. Teil 1, die Nazis. The first problem is that once liberalism is established, it has a tendency to slide to the right wing, and it does this for two reasons. Firstly, it places a lot of emphasis on freedom, particularly freedom of speech, and tolerating a diversity of opinions, though as we've seen by now, it does make some exceptions. And that's all cool, and freedom of speech is great. However, that does make liberalism very susceptible to propaganda. Philosophers like John Rawls and Karl Popper did work on this. It's called the paradox of tolerance. What do we do if we want to be tolerant, but somebody is expressing viewpoints that are themselves intolerant, even to the extent that they're incompatible with liberalism? But actually, academic philosophers were beaten to the punch on this question by actual fascists. Nazi philosopher Karl Schmitt realized that in a liberal society like interwar Germany, the Nazis could disguise their propaganda as just another political viewpoint, and so demand that their viewpoint be heard. Even though they weren't really debating using facts and reason at all, because they were spreading propaganda, they could take advantage of the liberal love of tolerance and free speech to spread their ideology under the radar, pretending to value liberalism even whilst preparing its destruction. And that's exactly what happened. And something similar is happening with right-wing groups now. I've talked before on the show about how white supremacist propaganda works these days, and ContraPoints has an excellent video on how white supremacists, or the alt-right as they call themselves, spread propaganda under the guise of liberal free speech. And liberals will help them do it. Interview them, offer them platforms, complain when leftists shut them down, without really digging into the ideologies on either side there. There's a reason that certain YouTube channels who bill themselves as classical liberals, not naming any names or calling anyone out or anything, have found over the years that they get a lot of attention from the far right. That's because fascists know that they can count on liberals to give them the room to grow and recruit. But maybe it's harsh to say that that's a fatal problem with liberalism. We could, in theory, counter that by educating people about how propaganda works and how to stop it. But Liberalism enables the right wing in a second way, a more powerful way, too, by being so linked with capitalism. I want to make it clear that this point is entirely separate from any critique of capitalism. You could be the most hardcore, Ayn Rand-loving capitalist, and it would still be true that liberalism's alliance with capitalism causes it to slide to the right. As explained in episode 2, liberalism exists to justify capitalism. Left-wing ideologies, like socialism, are incompatible with capitalism. But capitalism is compatible with fascism. And so, liberalism slides right a lot easier than it slides left. As an example, let's look at capitalism under some right-wing regimes. Ever hear of Zyklon B, the gas that was used in the gas chambers in the Holocaust? Well, Zyklon is a brand name, not a chemical name. The Nazis bought Zyklon B from corporate manufacturers, mainly a company called Degusa, which also processed the gold fillings of a lot of the people who were murdered. Degusa is still running today as a subsidiary of the Ivonic Corporation. Now, obviously, a lot of capitalist businesses that were run by Jews were shut down by the Nazis, but a lot of Gentile capitalists and rich folks and liberals slid to the right and supported Hitler because he opposed the socialists who were challenging their profits. Even though Hitler's party were called the National Socialists, the name was, deliberately, misleading. The Nazis actually hated socialists and killed quite a lot of them. As another example, in the USA in the 60s, Black Panthers like Kwame Ture noticed that a lot of American white liberals were willing to go to bat for racial segregation. 
Despite their apparent commitment to freedom, Ture's diagnosis was that white American liberals got economic stability from the status quo, and so they were more likely to side with white supremacist capitalists than they were with a black socialist like MLK. And another example, Ronald Reagan, to name just one US president, provided military and financial aid to Guatemalan governments that were routinely murdering civilians in their thousands because those governments presented themselves as anti-communist against the far left. We're still seeing this today in the resistance a lot of liberals have to even mildly socialist politicians like Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn, versus the apparent willingness of the US Republican Party and British Conservative Party, who are still liberal with a capital L, to be soft on white supremacists and form coalitions with anti-LGBT, anti-women's rights creationists. This happens because liberalism supports capitalism, and capitalism goes where the money is. Part 2. Rational Self-Interest The second problem with liberalism is that it's wrong about how human beings make decisions. Liberalism, especially neoliberalism, likes to imagine that human beings are individual, rational decision makers. There's the focus on individualism, which we talked about in episode 1, and also this idea that the best outcome will happen if everybody pursues their own rational self-interest. That idea goes all the way back to Adam Smith, and is key to the way that liberals imagine people navigate the free markets that they support. Again, there are two problems with this. The first is that the model of the rational, self-interested decision-maker is too reductionist. Even if Adam Smith was right that the best result would happen if everyone did that, the point is kind of moot, because people don't make decisions like that. You can read all sorts of psychology and economics books that'll show you this, in fact I've listed a couple I recommend in the description. At the very least, it's not as simple as hardcore liberalism presumes it is. Second, yes people can make decisions, but the focus on individual decision making ignores any kind of systemic analysis. One of the best examples I've ever seen on this comes from Helen Shugar, who talks about the way we decide what to eat. Yes, individuals make decisions, but the options from which we can choose are often shaped by forces well beyond individual control. For instance, lobbying. In the USA, government subsidies for crops like corn mean that a lot of cheap, unhealthy oils and sugars enter the food supply, and attempts to change that have to confront the fact that big corn, as funny a phrase as that is, is a powerful lobby with a lot of influence over government policy. So if we're talking about things like obesity, which Shugar is, the individualistic focus of liberalism is gonna stop us from understanding it. Food isn't the only topic where this happens. Maybe you can think of some others. Chestrikia. Problema Capitalisma. The final problem is one that I'm only gonna touch on briefly, and it's that liberalism supports capitalism. In fact, as we saw in episode two, liberalism assumes capitalism, or at least it always has done. So if there are problems with capitalism, liberalism is gonna be supporting and propping up those problems. Now, this is not the place for a sustained critique of capitalism, and in fact, I've kind of done that series already. And to be fair, a lot of capitalists don't have a problem with capitalism. Not everyone thinks it's bad. And, since liberalism exists to justify it, a lot of liberals don't have an explicit problem with it either. But a lot of liberals are aware that capitalist energy production is rapidly destroying the planet, and that the poverty capitalism enforces isn't really necessary. And that once again, capitalism is doing deals with the right wing. A lot of liberals are worried that capitalism might not be able to survive the coming waves of automation, or they've noticed that although it generates a lot of wealth, that wealth tends to stay at the top. And some liberals are even starting to notice that some of the so-called benefits of capitalism, like providing innovation and keeping quality high and costs low, are actually beginning to undermine themselves in the long term. And if you're one of the liberals who've noticed even one of these things, Whilst you're critiquing capitalism, maybe you might want to start having a look at liberalism as well. Comrade? These problems are why I titled this series What Was Liberalism, not What Is Liberalism. New ideologies are emerging now on the left, and white supremacist fascism is re-emerging on the right, which prompts the question, what will come next? And that might just prove to be the most important question of the 21st century. 
I hope you enjoyed this series. If you did, I have a tip jar at paypal.me slash philosophytube. Think of it like me putting a hat round at the end of the lecture. Or patreon.com slash philosophytube is where you could make a monthly donation to help me keep making videos like this one. And don't forget to subscribe.